title of this morning's message is Lift Up Your Eyes. Lift up your eyes. And you see what's going on around the world today in, in uh, Libya and Egypt. And this seems like one nation after another is beginning to tumble down. And then you look at our own nation, Wisconsin and Ohio. And uh, they, Lord, what are you going, what's going on? I can tell you what's going on. The Lord is shaking everything that can be shaken. He's shaking everything that can be shaken. And, uh, <clears throat> and one thing that Satan is after in your life is your faith. And so you may, may your faith be rock solid today. And, and our focus, and especially in these last days, man's focus, must be upon the work that Christ has called every believer to be a part of. That's where our focus needs to be. You see, we have a tendency to look at all the things that are going around us, and that can consume our time. And, but know today that God's eyes is not upon all of the turmoil. He already said, in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines. Have you, have you been to the grocery store lately? Prices seem to be going up, don't they? There will be famines and all kinds of other things. And God's eyes are not upon those things. God's eyes are upon His people. His eye is upon you today if you belong to Him. If you're not saved, then His eye is not upon you. Now, I encourage you today to give your life to Jesus Christ so that his eye will be upon you. Now, with that truth in mind that his eyes are upon his people, today's message is designed for us to get a true picture of who we are in Christ and to plant our feet firmly upon the Word of God. Don't, don't plant it on some radio personality, whomever it may be. Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, or whoever. Don't plant your foot on them. Don't plant it on our government. Don't even plant it on the church. Plant it on the Word of God. This is where we plant it. Uh, and I'm, I'm not against Glenn Beck or Rush, Rush Limbaugh. I listen to them when I can, but that, that's, that's neither here nor there. But we have a tendency to, to take everything they say as what? Gospel. <laughs> they don't know any more than you know. God's words, where the truth is at. And so... Trust in the Lord for all things, even when they look impossible. Trust in the Lord. We have one main text today. I'm going to look at several other portions of Scripture uh, that will enlighten our position and prove that our victory is already within our grasp. We already have victory. And what is needed on our part is to hear from God in every situation. Whatever situation you are in life, you need to hear from the Lord on that. You have to hear from God. Stand upon His Word, either His written Word, His preached Word, or the Word to your heart through the time you spend in prayer. And then you act upon His Word, and victory is ours. So three things today. Number one, what do you do when it appears you don't hear from God? You ever been there? What do you do when it appears you don't have enough? That's the second point. And then the third point is, what do you do when your staff doesn't work? John 4, 35. Do not say, or do you not say, there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Father, help us to get a good handle on your word today. Lord, and, and plant it deep within our hearts. Father, we are a victorious people just because we're saved. Because you live within us. We are victorious. So Lord, help us to walk in victory. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. And so Lord, may your word today as it goes forth as you have given it to me take a deep root in our hearts and our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What do I do when it appears that I've not heard from God? I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. A popular portion of Scripture, a well-known portion of Scripture with Elijah. You ever hear of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Mount Carmel? 1 Kings 18, what happened after that? Verses 41 through 46. I'm going to read that. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. 
So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed down on the ground, put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up and look unto the sea. So he went and looked and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. It came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand. That's pretty small. Rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Okay, now, Elijah had just finished this miraculous um, the, the, uh, experiencing amazing things in his life, and he just had defeated 400 prophets of Baal with, with a sword. Uh, amazing thing. And then he prayed rain down from Mount Carmel, or from, from heaven, <coughs> upon Mount Carmel, upon the sacrifice. And so after all that happened, something happens after that whole miracle there. And who would have thought that this great man of faith, whom Elijah was, still is, the Bible tells us that Elijah prayed, what, effectual, fervent prayers. He was a man of prayer. He knew how to pray. And who would have thought that this man who knows how to pray would have to pray seven times for one thing? Have you ever heard somebody tell you that if you pray more than once, you don't have faith? Try telling Elijah that. He prayed seven times for the same thing. He prays for rain, which God had told him that he would send. If you go back to the first part of chapter 17, when, when Elijah first comes on the scene, he goes right, right straight to Ahab, and he says, There will not be dew, nor will there be rain, unless I say so. God told him to say that, except by my word. The land was parched from drought, and he, he sits on this mountaintop praying for rain. And, and he, he sends a servant, you know, one time, go look, there's nothing, there's nothing. He does that six times. No answer six times. What would you do? Come up for the altar for prayer, and the Lord doesn't answer your prayer. Would you come up twice? Would you come up three times? Would you come up four times? Would you come up five times? I think you'd start getting weary at four. Wouldn't you? We'd get weary at five. Would you come up seven times? Seven times. And this was a man of prayer. This guy knew how to touch the face of God. And maybe you've had this type of experience and you've had great victories in Christ. And then the moment you desperately need him... You need something, you pray, and God seems silent. You hear nothing. And so you pull out some of your old tapes. You, uh, you, you talk to your pastor. You, you keep praying and, and still no answer. What do you do? It can be a confusing time. What do you do? What did Elijah do? Well, when you search the Scripture, and you'll find that Elijah on the seventh time... It tells us here, he, he put his head between his knees. I think you'll actually find somewhere where he covered his thumb with a cloak. And he prays again. In essence, Elijah is saying, Lord, I'm shutting out all the world around me. I, 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 I need to shut all, all this stuff out. Because you know what? I need a word from you. You can get a word from anybody today, can't you? Words are cheap. You can get a word from anybody. And too often we would stand on a word from anybody. God wants us to get a word from Him. And to get a word from Him, I need to shut myself out from everybody and everything else and shut myself in with God and get a word from God. Lord, I, I need you. I need a word from you. I, I des we desperately need some rain here. Or in our case here in Port Clinton, Lord, we desperately need some snow. Now, somebody prayed that last night, and I want to know who it was. <laughs> Lord, we desperately need some rain here. We're in a drought. And you told me that you were going to send it, and I just prayed six times. 
and you haven't sent it yet. If it doesn't come, we're in a heap of trouble. We need it. And then something happened. He sent him again, and, and, and he looks up his head, and he sees a, a small cloud the size of a, of a man's fist coming up out of the Mediterranean Sea. Whatever sea it was. Now, now, there's just a small cloud. Now Elijah knows that God had heard his prayer, but it's only a small cloud. That's okay. And he, and he yells at his servant, here it comes. There is a sound, he says, of an abundance of rain. One small cloud, a sound of abundance. Have you ever seen one small cloud and worried about a thunderstorm? It's only a small cloud. You see, faith heard God's word to his heart. Faith saw the cloud rise, and faith responded to what he saw in this small cloud. God, he knew right then, God answered his prayer. But it's only a small cloud. Faith said God answered his prayer. The flesh looks at what it sees. Faith gets a word from God. And he says, go tell King Ahab, prepare your chariot and get to Jezreel before the rain stops you. But he, he knew it was going to come down. Was it raining dog, cats and dogs? Buckets? God has a vital message for us today in this story. And it has to do with chariots. Of all things, Jezreel is where they were headed to. Is a city of chariots. That's what it means. And in this story, chariots represent the strength of man. Chariots represent the power to speed ahead. Chariots represent something that, 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 uh, that, uh, something that accomplishes something powerful. And in our society, there is a certain lifestyle that is like the chariots of Elijah's day. It's a lifestyle of comfort, a lifestyle of ease, where all of our needs are provided. Now, ah Ahab was a king here, and you know you can imagine what kind of chariot he had. We have credit cards galore. You and I have easy access to about whatever we want. We have easy access to, to whatever we need. Right? You know, everybody pull out your cell phone and see who's got the newest one. Just kidding. We have access to whatever we need. And this chariot lifestyle is an easy lifestyle because of this access. And to the believer, it has great appeal. And we look at the world around us, and we look at all the success that the world is having. Impressive chariots and beautiful stallions pulling these chariots. And they are means to wealth and means to ease and, and a means to security. And we, then the church, we tend then to, to think that we operate or are to operate the same way as the world operates. And that's way off the mark. We don't operate the way the world operates. I don't live in man's economy. I live in God's economy. And we seek to obey the voice of God. We don't seek, as a servant of God, we don't seek the things that the world seeks. We seek to obey the voice of God and pursue His righteousness and the concerns of His kingdom first. And we learn early on in our walk with Christ that if we seek first His kingdom, then what? All these things are added. We don't have to worry about them. But there are times when believers find themselves lacking. Or believers find themselves not having the resources to do certain things in their lives and maybe not even having the resources to do what they feel is their calling or their ministry. And they are so, so they, they, are, they are then tempted to think the resources are out there. The world has them. How can I get them? Well, Elijah here, he knew better than to go after the world's resources. Imagine the scene here. Ahab... And his royal chariot, some you know, humongous thing that you would see a, a Cinderella or whatever. 
towering over Elijah. Elijah looking up at him and, and he said, you know, you have, the, you, you have the most impressive power on earth here, Ahab. You got it made. You got a vast fleet of these chariots pulled by the best of horses in the world. But I'm going to tell you something. Your swift chariots are no match for the power of the Lord. Your swift chariots are no match for the Lord God of Israel. So you better get going while the going is good. Or you're not going to get to Jezreel. You're going to get stuck in the mud. And next we read there towards the end of that portion of Scripture where the hand of God comes upon Elijah. And it says Elijah girds up his loins. He gathers up his garment. And, and they, they, would, they, they wore long... I'm glad we don't wear them today. He wore long robes and he'd, he'd had to pull it up and tuck it in his belt so he could run. Gird up the loins. And that's what he would do. He'd say he girded them up and he runs... And he gets to Jezreel before Ahab does. He outran horses over a distance of several miles. I shoveled, helped Dwayne and Thomas shovel the front this morning. Whew. That's why I'm coughing. The question is, how did, how did Elijah do that? 1 Peter 1.13 tells us, Gird up the loins of your mind. Take up your garment means gird up your loins. To gird up your loins means this, prepare yourself. Lift up your eyes, Jesus is coming soon. Prepare yourself, Christ is about to break through the eastern sky. Now we are called to run a race. And we need to gird up our loins. Prepare ourselves. How do I prepare myself? I prepare myself by reinforcing my faith in the Word of God and my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put out, to gird up your loin, put out, <coughs> excuse me, of, put, put out of, of, of the way all that disturbs your mind. Okay? All your worries, all your frets, all your problems, all your doubts. Put those things aside because they impede your spiritual health. They impede your walk with God. They impede your spiritual faculties. And when I start to pay attention to all these things going around me, I begin to walk by what? Sight and not by faith. We cannot afford in these last days to walk by sight. We must walk by faith. It's the only way to walk. How do I do that? Get these things out of my head. Don't concentrate on the things of the world. And that's your responsibility. Set your hope on Christ. Set your hope on His Word. Put your faith in Christ. It has a decisive impact on the way that you think. If you want to think and look at all the things that's going on in the world, I tell you, it's going to drain you and bring it down. When you start focusing on the things of Christ, when you start looking at who God is, what He has done, and what He's going to do, it can do nothing but raise you up. We are the church triumphant because we're saved. And all of us have a heavenly calling preordained by God and perhaps God has given you a vision and, and there's a big gap between that vision and it, mu and it being fulfilled in your life and you may feel discouraged today. And that's why we need to gird up the loins of our mind and remind ourselves of this truth. Don't be dismayed by the power of the world and by the power that, that you seem to lack. God has a different way for you. God has a different way for His church. When we set our eyes and, and uh, upon the Lord and, and allow His hand to move freely and anoint you like He has never anointed you before, I'm going to tell you today that you can outrun any chariot that the world has to offer. God wants to show Himself, Himself strong on your behalf. And a lot of times we go through various things in our lives just so God can show Himself strong. God wants to show Himself strong. You don't need what the world has. Because you can do more than people who have everything. If we trust in the Lord to accomplish His purpose in our life, 
You'll see it happen faster, uh, more powerfully, with more authority, and the Lord will be glorified through your life. You want the Lord to be glorified through your life? Give Him everything. Give Him everything. And what we need to succeed in God's calling is to be endued with power from on high, refilled continually every day of our lives, every morning, be led and walk in the Spirit. And Ahab finally arrives to Jezreel. Elijah is already at the local McDonald's having his latte. And here comes Ahab rolling in to town. What's the point? You are going to see God's promises come to pass because He will give you the power to do it. He will do it. Not because of some worldly chariot. Now, if Elijah had a chariot, it would have been no match for the king's chariot. We can't do things that the world does as good as the world does it. So why even try? And if he would have had a chariot, he would have missed what the Lord wanted to do in his life. See, by us seeking what the world has, we miss what God can do on our behalf. We miss the strength of God and God's desire to show himself strong. So our calling is this. Rely entirely on the Lord. Rely entirely upon the Lord. The second thing is, what do you do when it appears you don't have enough? The book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, says, And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, there were only ten. When one came to the, to the wine to draw out fifty baths from the press, there was only twenty. Well, it's what they, it's, they came up short. Every time they needed something... They came up short. You ever have that in your life? They come up short. So we see here that Israel needs a certain amount of material for this construction project. They needed 50 measures, only received 20. Needed 20 and only got 10. And maybe you have felt like that on occasion in your life or in your calling. And you needed certain measures to accomplish what God has set before you. And you only get a percentage of it. Doesn't that just throw you? Don't you just love coming up short? (laughs) God has a message for you today through Elijah's situation back in 1 Kings. God wants to supply for you what you can't supply for yourself. Isn't it just like human nature? When we supply things for ourselves, who do we give the credit to? Self? Yeah. We give the credit. Man, do you see what I did? I already gave the credit for shoving the sidewalk to Dwayne, Thomas, and me. Right? I already did that. Lord, I'm sorry. We tend to give the credit to ourselves. God is a message. It's found in this text as well. He longs to double your harvest. Jesus and his disciples, John 4, 35... We're near some fields of grain. I know I'm kind of jumping from verse to verse. I'm trying to put this whole picture together for us. And Jesus points to the grain. And I mentioned this last Sunday just a little bit. He said, the fields are ready for harvest. There was four months yet. They were only halfway up. He said, don't say there's going to be a harvest four months from now. But rather, lift up your eyes. The harvest is ready when? Right now. Okay, now, now, I want you to think about that. That's a difficult saying because the plants are probably, like I said, only half grown. And anyone with common sense can look at those plants and, and say, they aren't even close to being ready for a harvest. Well, now, we know that Jesus was talking about souls. But this lesson of the harvest has a broader meaning for us, and it has to do with God's purpose in your life. And what Jesus is saying is this. You don't have to wait four months to be holy. You don't have to wait four months to kick a habit. You don't have to wait four months to overcome some addiction. You don't have to wait four months to overcome some sin. You don't have to wait four months to get a burning passion for Christ. He's saying it's here right now. You can have victory right now. 
You don't have to wait for some Sunday in April or June or July. You can have it today. And it may look crazy. It may look impossible. And in your strength it is. But the Lord wants to expedite all things on your behalf. We are in the last days. And the Lord is going to speed things up in the last days. And there can be no excuses among us who are following Jesus Christ any longer. Jesus has set before us all things to grab a hold of. And it is up to us to grab a hold of them and move on. Some of you are waiting four months to do what God has called you to do last year. And you keep saying, I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, I'm telling you, week after week after week after week after week goes by. The question is, when are you going to do it? Four months. Jesus says, no, no more. No more excuses. The time to act is right now. So Jesus is declaring to us as a church and to many of you as individuals, no more excuses. The lesson of the harvest addresses every human excuse. Jesus is telling us there is no waiting in his kingdom. There is no waiting in the kingdom of God. If you wait four months, you're going to miss it. Matter of fact, you're going to miss him, and you're going to miss his blessings in your life if you wait any longer. It's time to toss every excuse known to believers right back to their source. What's their source? Satan and his hordes of demons. That is the source of excuses. Satan is a father of lies. He's also the father of every excuse. Because Jesus never gave an excuse. Amen. We do. Jesus never did. Aren't you glad when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't come up with some excuse not to go to the cross? Yes, we are. What is your excuse today to not do, for not doing what God has called you to do? Throw it back to the face of the Father of lies. Jesus is coming soon. And now is the time to follow him without excuse. Now is your time for your calling to be fulfilled. Why? Because souls are hanging in the balance and they will either go to heaven or they will go to hell because of you. And if you have an excuse, I'm sorry, you're going to send somebody right to hell with that excuse. Now Amos 9.13 I got that marked somewhere in my Bible. These small books are tough to find. Amos 9.13, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman, get a hold of this, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And speaking of the last day's harvest that the Lord is going to send to us, and the Lord says to Amos, Behold, the days are coming when the plowman is going to overtake the reaper. He said, Not, not only are the, are the fields ripe four months early, the plowman is going to overtake the reaper. And just as in what Jesus said to the disciples, this doesn't make any sense. How can a plowman take over the reaper? It's physically impossible for both a plowman and a reaper to labor in the same spot at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Thank you. But that's exactly what was happening here. What is happening in this scripture verse is that there's going to be two crops... In one season, God wants to bring about a double harvest in your life. What is a double harvest in your life? What is a situation right now or the issue that God is speaking to you about? Well, he's not speaking to me. If he's not speaking to you, then you're not praying. You're not spending time with him. So what's the situation or the issue that God is speaking to you about? Is it for a physical healing? Is it it for a financial miracle? Is it for your children who aren't saved or a spouse that's not saved or or, or a household or, or your job or your calling? What is it? No matter what it is, God has reserved for you in these last days a double harvest. Hallelujah. God is going to bring a double harvest. 
That means we need twice the workers of what we have in the church right now. And for that reason, the Lord is calling us to throw away the excuses. All of us have been gifted one way or another. And I don't have to remind you the story of the talents, but I will anyways. One had five, one had two, one had one. What did the guy do with one? He not only buried it, he gave up, he gave it what? An excuse why he buried it. And what did Jesus do with him? Do we want to know? Or would we rather just skip that part? Read it. No matter what it is that God is calling you to do, God has reserved for you. Reserved. It's in reserve. He's just waiting for us to be obedient so he can do what? Open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Call it a double harvest. He, he wants to give you a double harvest of his presence. Who doesn't want that? He wants to give you a double harvest of his grace. Oh, I need that. He wants to give you a double harvest of his resources. Oh, Lord, we need that. He wants to give you a double harvest of everything that is necessary for this life. And it may seem impossible to us, but God's word tells us otherwise that we have learned today already. If you need 20 measures in these last days, God is going to give you 40. The secret is for us to never look to the chariots of the world for our resources. Our Heavenly Father owns them all. He's waiting for us to get down on our knees and to close ourselves in and put our head between our knees and say, God, if we don't have it, we're sunk. We need you now. He wants to resource you with his power. He wants to resource you with his glory. He wants to resource you with his supernatural ability. Well, I don't know if I can do it. Well, I don't really know if I can even preach. But God will resource you with his ability to do it. And maybe you're thinking that this all seems too good to be true. Strength for the journey. Ability to outrun a chariot. A double harvest. So how do I get it in my life? I want to close by looking at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. <coughs> 2 Kings follows 1 Kings. I know that much. 2 Kings 4, 29. Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. And this is so neat. I'm going to address this too. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. If anybody says hi to you, don't even answer. But lay my staff on the face of the child. So, here Elisha has faced, is facing one of the biggest steps of faith, moments of faith in his life. He's approached by this woman, if you know the, the story of the Shunammite woman, where she asked for a child, right? And so Elisha prays, and then she, she brings forth this son, and only for years later for the son to die, working out in the field with his dad. And she comes back to him and says, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've wept, I've pled, but I've received nothing from the Lord. My son is gone. I don't have the strength to go on. Even though the whole time she said it as well. Basically, he said, this, this is more than I can bear. And Elisha responds by doing something very unusual. Very unusual. We just read it. He tells his servant Gehazi, and here it is again, gird up your loins and head to this house. Prepare yourself. Take my staff in hand and go. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. You know, sometimes God sends us on a mission. And we're focused right on that mission, right? And somebody will say hi to you and you don't, you don't even hear them. Right? Ever happened to you? Happens to me a lot. It's either because I'm focused on a mission or I didn't hear you. And we over there say, well, I never... He walked right past me and didn't even respond to me. The Word of God says, if you're on a mission, don't pay attention to them. Keep on going. Some of us are offended way too easy. You get your... <laughs> I won't say it. You get... You really get... <laughs> you know what I'm saying. 
and he says, if you see them, don't even say hi to them. Just keep on cruising, buddy. You got a, you got a mission ahead of you. Church, let us go from this day forward. Don't get so offended. Amen. Are you with me? Don't offend people and don't get so offended. All right. We're past that. I don't have to preach on that. Okay, so don't get offended. Now remember, somebody keep track of who is here today and let me know. He said, don't even reply to them. And if anyone greets you, don't reply. And don't even say hi. Just, just keep on going. And then lay my staff on the face of this child. He did as he was instructed, but there was still no sign of life. And he tells Elisha, the child has not awakened. So here's a question for us today. What do you do when your staff doesn't work? What do you turn to when, when, you, when every effort you put forth doesn't accomplish the intended purpose? What do you resort to when, when everything you've tried brings no result? What do you, what do, you do? I'm going to tell you something today. We have no resource but Jesus. He's our solution. And in this story, when you study it out, Elisha is a type of Christ. And I didn't read the whole story, but Elisha goes to the home. And what does he do? He goes up to the room where the boy is laying dead on the bed. And he stretches himself over the body of the child. Eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, feet to feet. And he prays. And he breathes into this boy. And the boy sneezes seven times. And Elisha goes, oh, yuck! No, he didn't. He stayed right there. Aren't you glad Christ doesn't run when you sneeze? He sneezes seven times, and he comes to life. There's no wonder the Lord can't use some of us. We, we are so afraid of everything. He sneezes seven times, and he comes to life. How did that happen? Church, it is Jesus. It is Jesus who must breathe life into our situation, life into our calling, life into our circumstances. It is Jesus who must breathe life into our trials. When we have no hope, when we have no resources, when we have no ability, Christ will breathe his supernatural life into the problem. We need Jesus to lie upon our situation. We need Jesus to breathe his resurrection life into the situation. Our mouth must become Jesus' mouth. Our, our hands must become his hands. Our eyes, <coughs> excuse me, our eyes must become his eyes. And our feet must become his feet. And today as you, as you look around, look at what you're facing in life. Are you trusting in the chariots of the world? Are you trusting in the horses of the world? Or are you trusting in the name of the Almighty God? Where's your trust? David said in Psalm 27, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's who I trust in. And I, and I pray that that is who you trust in. And if you're not, that you begin trusting in Him. Where your eye is looking is where your faith is established. Is your eye on some chariot of the world? Is your eye on the situation in your life? Or is your eye on the name of Jesus Christ? The day is coming. And you can look, you can see it in our society today. Where you are going to be stripped of everything that you are used to. You're used to your health insurance. Don't be surprised when it goes. I trust in the name of the Lord my God. Take this whole world, take its benefits, take its insurance, take its government, take anything that it has, just give me Jesus. 
He's my source. So don't freak out. In these last days, when you start losing benefit after benefit after benefit, the benefits are not your source. Jesus is your source. He's a healer. He's a provider. Has he not promised to provide every need that we have? Can he do it? He will. Absolutely, he will do it. So it's time in these last days to put our eyes on the name of Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes focused on him. If it's on Christ, you can expect a double blessing. You can expect a double harvest in these last days. You can expect God to increase your measure, and you can expect to outrun the enemy. It's time for the church to admit this. Lord, we don't have anything. We don't. You, on the other hand, have everything. It's time to admit that. No resource, Lord, in this world can compare to what you have and who you are. We need you to breathe resurrection, life, and power into our situation, my situation, or or we're not going to make it. Your situation, or you're not going to make it. Lord, with you, I can do all things. Lord, with you, I can outrun any chariot that this world puts up beside you. This world cannot come up, cannot design, cannot develop, cannot construct anything to compare to the power of the Almighty God. No way! Never has. So what are you facing in life? And where are your eyes focused? If you've never given your life to Christ, today is a day of salvation. And if you have given your life to Christ and you're not serving Him with all of your heart, then you're not serving Him at all. You need to give him all that you are. You see, Jesus isn't coming back for a half a heart. He's not coming back for a people whose, whose pants are all wrinkled, but the shirt is spotless. He's coming back for a bride, a church without one spot, without one wrinkle. And that can only take place through the righteousness of Christ. Musicians and worship team, if you would come.